Would you join me in welcoming everyone online today as well? From the Gold Coast here in Australia. For anyone who's maybe watching from one of our locations across Australia as well, we want to say in this Christmas season, a Merry Christmas to you and as you get ready to celebrate next week in Sydney and Melbourne as well. Well, last Sunday, or two Sundays ago, 14 days ago, right after I finished preaching here in the, in the evening, I lost my voice completely in our last November rain experience. So I, I felt really, uh, really quite ordinary, actually. And I went home, was flat on my bed, uh, flat, in, uh, flat asleep on my bed, didn't wake up, woke up with razor blade feelings in my throat. And uh, I just honestly just thought I had a, a flu or a cold. And uh, my mum said to me, she says, have you tested yourself on COVID? I said, no, I'm immune to COVID. I've, for years, I've managed to avoid it. I slept in a bed next to my wife who had it. I've traveled through different parts of the world where there was outbreaks and I never got it. I said, I'm immune to it. She said, just test yourself. So I went and tested myself and instantly two lines appeared. And sure enough, the guy who thought he was immune to COVID had COVID. And it absolutely smashed me. Firstly, I want to say to every person that had COVID and I had no empathy for you in your recovery, I apologize to you. You are wonderful human beings. <laughs> I had to apologize to our staff this week. I was like, when, when the big COVID outbreak, I was like, come on, guys, let's just get back into it. And everyone's like, I'm just, I'm struggling. Uh, so I've been slowly getting my energy levels back this week. Uh, but firstly, I do apologize. But I have had the last uh, almost better part of two weeks to, to be still. And for someone like me to be still and to stop is dangerous in some ways, because I think a lot. And I start thinking about what's coming up. But it, as part of that process of being still, I actually had some really good time to reflect. And it's something that probably isn't part of my nature by, by sort of if it was standard operation. I, I'm a visionary leader, so t- typically I'm always living a year, of my, a year ahead of myself. I'm planning out the conference in 2026. I'm thinking way down the track. But just this last Wednesday, our eldest daughter, Taylor, she turned 18. And it made me stop and just think, wow, 18 years has gone really quick. I am now the father of an adult human being. And it really made me stop and think a little bit and say, before I fly into next year, before I think about all that's coming in next year, whether it's for our family, whether it's for you as a church family, God, what can I learn from this year? If I was to stop and look in the rear vision mirror this year, what could I learn from this year? What could I do better? What did I do well that I should keep doing? What are some things that we did well as a church? I mean, I really stopped to think about what are the things that before we dive in head first into the new year and we've all got New Year's resolutions, what would it look like to reflect in the revision mirror of our life? For me, that's a challenge because, like I said, by nature, I'm visionary, so I want to look forward. But there's a reason in a car that you not only can look out the front window, but you've also got that little mirror that allows you to look at the back because behind you, there's things that are important. Something can come out of nowhere. There can be things in your life that if you're not careful, if you look behind you and there's a destructive pattern happening back there, you'd want to address that. And so I got my phone out this week. And as I was lying there in bed, I started going through the year. Because often a year can just fold into all kinds of memories, but when you stop and go through your camera roll, and actually look at each photo and ask yourself the question, where was I? What was I feeling? Is there anything to learn from that photo? Is there any reason I didn't take a photo for those two months? What was the emotions I was feeling that I didn't want to take a photo? Was it a good reason because I was having such a good time that I didn't have time to take a photo? Or are there things that if I look back at it and think, man, I could learn from what happened in that season. There were some moments there that I could be grateful for. There are some moments there that I can grow from. There are some moments there that I look back and it brings a smile to my face because it brought joy to the reflection in that moment. And so this morning, if you're taking notes, my message is simply entitled, 2023 Lessons from the Rear Vision Mirror. Lessons from the Rear Vision Mirror. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter nine and I'm gonna go to verse one and I'm gonna speak a little bit about a pattern that Jesus shows us that not only should we be having vision for our future and dreaming for what's next, but also that there are moments in time that we do need to stop and we do need to reflect and we do need to learn from the things that we've experienced and have had in our past. And so Luke chapter 9 says this, when Jesus had called the 12 together, this is the disciples, he gave them the power, the authority to drive out all the demons and to cure diseases. 
And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and no extra shirt. And whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like the start of a year to me. Full of good ideas, full of a sense of this is what we're going to do, this is where we're going to go, this is what we're going to do in the name of Jesus or in our family or in our life. And so Jesus shows us this picture of like, we've got to have vision. We've got to have a sense of this is what things look like. But we then also see a few verses later, an important part of our learning experience that Jesus also modeled that we must stop and reflect on what we have just done. In verse 10, it goes on to say this, And when the apostles had returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. Bethsaida. In other words, Jesus not only had vision for the disciples, but he also created a space and moment where they could reflect on what had just happened. I don't know what the conversation looked like. I might have been, Peter, okay, what crazy thing did you do this time? Tell us about the crazy miracles and did it happen? Did you have to kick off the dust off your feet? What were you doing in that process? What's interesting that we see vision given, we see a feedback mechanism and a report back system take place that Jesus models. And then the very next story, which is the afternoon of this moment, is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Before... The miracle took place. There was a time of reflection and learning so that God could do even greater things in their midst. And so today I want to put to you, what does God want to do next year as a result of you being willing to stop, pause and reflect and say, God, what can we do better next year? God, what is it that I can learn from this year? God, what things were there holes in my learning? I've got to tell you this year, even for me as a leader, Ellen mentioned it before, uh, those of you watching online, we had an MC moment. She said, we're, we're in a church that we've never been in a church bigger than the one we lead. Every day that I wake up for the last eight years has been bigger than anything I've been a part of. It has meant that we've had to grow every single step of the way. Every step we've had to, to mature. We've had to have wisdom in our life. We've had to have great mentors in our life. We've had to put ourselves in other environments so that it could stretch us and grow us in our mindset and in our thinking. And... Even during COVID as a leader, many of you know that feeling. There was no playbook. There was no rule book on how to lead in a crisis like COVID. Even the great, some of the greatest leaders on the planet had to retire as a result of the fact they did not know what to do with this humanity change that had shifted the way people thought. It's been a big season. And I look back at this year and go, sometimes I've beaten myself up that I could have done things better. And other times I've stopped and gone, I've got to be kind to myself to go, you don't know what you don't know. As long as you keep true to like, love God, love people and do my best, all we can do is stop and go, we could have done that better. Let's make some notes for next year. Hey, in that decision that we're making as a church, let's do better three years from now when that same thing comes around. Hey, at a board level, what do we, what do, we do for the future that we didn't know about five years ago? What can we do at a, at a pastoral level? What can we do at a marriage level, at a friendship level? And I think sometimes we can really beat ourselves up. And I, I know that this year I probably have done a bit of that saying, God, like I'm frustrated because I want to keep growing. God, I want us to keep on moving forward. But there's been moments where God said, hey, don't forget to keep taking that test that you haven't passed yet. Don't forget that thing that back there, that if we can get that right, it's going to only help us in our future. And so today I come to you really transparently to say, I mean, we haven't got it all together. But by the grace of God, I know that we keep turning up loving people, going, God, we don't know what we don't know in a world that we don't know what's coming. But what I do know is this, that the more that we stick together and we put God at the center of all we do and we keep learning and growing as a church and as individuals, you just watch what God will do next year. You just watch what God will do in five years from now. My prayer is that your kids are better for it. My prayer is that your marriage is better for it. My prayer is that you love Jesus more than ever before. And so today I want to do something really different. Is that okay? I've never done this before and I don't know if I'm ever going to do this again. I decided I'm going to let you in into my private world in a, in a unique way. As I was reflecting on these photos that I went through this year, I thought, what if I was to preach this morning from my photos? If I showed you six or seven photos of things that you would never have seen on Instagram or anything else, 
that I can give a reflection on biblically to say, these are the things that God's been teaching me. And here are the biblical lessons that we can all learn as we reflect on the year gone by so that we go into next year and we love, so we go into next week and we go hard at Christmas time and we love that. But as we get into 2024, my prayer is that this week, maybe you would stop and reflect. You might get your camera roll out and go, okay, what can I learn from this year? What have I seen this year that I could do differently? What could I grow up in? And so I just thought today, this would be fun. I'm gonna tie every thought to a scripture of things that God has been showing me. And maybe as I bring this up, maybe you might be like, yeah, God's been showing me that too. Or I actually experienced that too. I know what you feel like. And so you ready to go on a bit of a wilder journey this morning? Joel's private snapshots, Joel's Kodak moments. Isn't it wild to think? 20 years ago, we used to take our film into a chemist or into a shop and they would hand them back to you after a month and even comment on which photos they liked the most. <laughs> Is that not wild? Oh, I really liked photo three when your wife was in a pool and you're like, what, sorry? <laughs> You've been through my photos? Oh yeah, we had to make sure that they all came through. The problem is the world we're living in right now is a Kodak world. We're overexposed and underdeveloped. That is the problem we're in. We're overexposed and underdeveloped. And so I'm gonna give you some thoughts this morning from seven photos in my private phone that you had no access to publicly this year. Some of them are a bit blurry because I cracked my camera halfway through the year. And maybe I'm a little bit tight and don't wanna replace my camera on my phone yet, that's okay. I'm just going to keep on going until I can't even type on the keys. It's good stewardship. Okay, let me show you photo number one. Now, I told you my daughter turned 18 this week. It's crazy how time can fly. Right now, my daughter Taylor is on a plane somewhere between Germany and Singapore coming home by herself. And 18 years ago, I held this little girl in my hand. I was the first person to see her. I was the first person to hold her. And 18 years later, it feels like that. And she's right now, who knows where, by the grace of God, safe. This was her school formal this year, and we were proud of her. And I know many of you had these moments. And if you could just excuse me today, just to allow you, allow me to, to be a dad, yeah. and to be a father in the house here. I think I've come to terms with the fact, this awkward term, if I can adult, so if I can be the parent of an adult daughter, then really I am actually a father in the faith now as well. It makes me grow up in my mind a little bit about what maybe the next season will look like for me as a father in the faith and a father as, with adult children. Maybe it looks like pastoring a little bit differently. Maybe it looks like saying less at times where I want to be over energetic and over enthusiastic, but maybe holding back a little bit with a bit more wisdom might show people some different ways of thinking. But I look at this photo, and I bet you all, but I look at this and think to myself, where has time gone? And here's our first lesson for today in the year in review, in reflection, is that seasons are temporary, they're not permanent. Seasons are temporary, not permanent, because I wanna tell you this, when I look at that photo, if you'd taken me back 15 years ago when we had, Taylor was three, Summer was one and a half, and life was crazy, I didn't think that we had any more possible capacity in our life. Sometimes I look at you as parents with all these little kids around me and I think, sucks to be you right now. <laughs> but sometimes I look and go, gee, I wish I could be back there. If you are a mum or a dad of little kids right now, you're gonna make it, come on. Let's encourage them. You're gonna get through it. It's hard, but it goes like that. But sucks to be you at times. There's been times where like, I'll invite people over and they're like, oh, we've got this thing on that thing. I'm like, mate, I'm not coming. All the best with that. I've been there, that's not my season. But Ecclesiastes chapter three tells us about the seasons that we need to understand, that they're temporary. Maybe they're gonna be a month, maybe they're gonna be a week, maybe they're gonna be a year, but they're not fatal long-term things. Ecclesiastes three verse one says, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die. Hey, if you've lost a loved one this year, we're with you, we're praying for you. I know it's not easy. 
There's a time to plant. There's a time to uproot. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to tear down and a time to build. There's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time to scatter stones and to gather them a time to gather them, sorry, gather them. And there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. It's a time to search and a time to give up. There's a time to keep and a time to throw away for all you hoarders. There's a time to tear and a time to mend. There's a time to be silent and a time to speak. And there's a time to love and there's a time to hate. There's a time for war and there's time for peace. In other words, the scriptures tell us there are times and often we don't do well at interpreting what season am I in. Let me give you a piece of advice that maybe could really help you. I've learned over my lifetime, don't make long-term decisions in seasons where you're most tired. If anything, actually, this is the time of the year that you want to be very careful not to be making long-term decisions. It's been a big year for many of you. Maybe it's been tough on the financial front with the changes in the economy. Maybe there's been things happening in your life that have been challenges, but this is not the time to go, that's it, I'm going to throw in my towel, I'm just going to go do something completely. No, now is the time to go, I need to rest. I need to get my energy back. I need to come in the new year ready to hear from what God's got to say when we have our prayer and fasting. That's the time when you start going, God, what do you want for my future? But wisdom says in seasons, slow down. Understand where you're at. Understand what God's doing in your life. For those of you here that are parents of little children, you're going to get through it. I look back at the 18 years and I can see three distinct seasons of parenting. Now, I'm not a parenting expert. One's now an adult, so I'm okay. I'm doing okay there. The first season, maybe zero to five, is what I call the physically exhausting years. That's where dads are so tired. It's where dads are constantly bathing their kids and feeding their kids. No. As parents... All you single parents here, man, you are our heroes. I don't know how you do it, honestly. You're amazing. Amazing. We love you. Two is hard enough, but one, I don't, I don't anyway, amazing, right? But look, all you mums, we know, you're amazing, right? It's physically exhausting. It's tiring. It's like, like get into bed at night time and just fall in. And then an hour later, you hear, oh my gosh, I got to get up again. You're like a permanent milk station. You know, it's, it's full on. It's a, it's a challenging season. But then you get to a point where, no one tells you this, no one gives you a certificate, but they probably just started now primary, you know, like kindergarten or year one. And that's the season I call the battle of the will. I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And it wears you out. You think, take me back to when they were two and I had to bath them and they were like, you know, just looked at you in the water and, and then they pooed at the same time, like, oh, okay, I'll clean the water. <laughs> and then you get to the teenage years, which is the battle of the emotion. Any parents got that going on at the moment? Give me a wave. I've got two teenage daughters and a wife. <laughs> it's amazing. It's easy. Easy. I don't know which season I'll take over any other one. I don't know which one. Is it better to go the emotional route? Is it better to go the physical route? Is it the, you know what I've learned? It's about being in the moment, in the season, and just focusing. I've, this is what I've got to do. This is where I am. God, give me the grace and the blessing on my life to be able to get through this season. But listen to me, seasons are temporary. If you're going through a tough time right now, it's temporary. It's temporary, temporary, temporary. If you've got a season right now where you're in pain, listen to me, there's a reason that your body goes from being an open wound to a scar. It's a physical representation of what was once painful is now just a memory. It's like that with parenting. Maybe this year it's been really tough financially. You're like, I don't know how I'm going to get through and then there's other seasons where you look at things and go, man, God has blessed me so much. I don't even know where to start. There were years for us when our kids were little, we hardly had anything. We couldn't even buy anyone a present. We couldn't even buy clothes. There's other seasons where we've been able to bless others. But I'm telling you, these seasons are temporary. Don't make long-term decisions thinking that everything is permanent. You will get through this. Someone listen to me that's going through a tough time today. You are going to get through this season. God has got a great plan for your 2024. Do not get stuck in a mindset that says, I can't get through this. For those of you that are raising kids, keep going. Those of you that are having tough days in your marriage, keep going. Those that have got some pain in your financial world, or maybe in your health right now, keep on going. That is my encouragement to you. We can all go home now. No, it's not. But seasons are real. 
Okay, let me show you the second photo. This is from my private phone. This is the version you don't get. These are special moments. This is at the Gold Coast Airport as Pastor Chris Hodges, as you many saw him at the conference. On the right here, we've got Pastor Lee Domain, who's just an absolute kingdom weapon when it comes to business. And then in the middle, probably the favourite uncle of Glow Church, Pastor Paul Dion, as they were getting ready to head back to their respective nations, Pastor Paul back to New Zealand, Pastor Chris and Lee about to go on a very long flight that Pastor Chris told me, I remember why I don't travel that far anymore after he got home. I'm so glad he came because I don't know if we'll ever travel again. But there's a few things that when I see that photo, emotions that came up in me. Firstly, man, I'm thankful that God has put these amazing men in my life that can speak wisdom in far bigger environments, in far bigger seasons that have gone through more things to go, Joel, you'll be fine. Keep going. Joel, we've got this. We've got you. I think as wisdom would say always, you want to make sure that you always have people that are doing far bigger things. If you are the biggest person in the room, get a new room. Because you'll get frustrated. But my responsibility as the leader of this church is constantly putting myself in people's lives like this that stretch me because it stretches all of us. It grows me, it grows all of us. I don't want to stay in small in my thinking. And so being around big thinkers that you sit back and just go, I don't know how you think that way. But there's an undertone of this photo that maybe you haven't picked up on. What maybe you don't know is that in this last few months since our conference, Pastor Paul, who we know was given three months of his life to remain because of the cancer that he was struggling with. That was two and a half years ago he was given that diagnosis. You saw him in August this year up here preaching on a stool with me or Ellen, depending on what service you're in, unable to read, struggling. Here's what you don't know. At Glow Conference this year, where we prayed for Pastor Paul as a conference, where Pastor Chris laid his hand on him and others of us around him laid their hand on him and prayed for him, Pastor Paul said, something happened in my body. He has been given the all clear and he's cancer free right now. Come on, if that's not worth celebrating something. Praise God, we're talking about three months to live. He's been given an all clear, no more cancer. He's back preaching, he's back leading, he's back flying around the place. I'm telling you right now, a miracle has taken place. It happened in our conference. You can miss what God's doing. And here's my second point for you today. God still heals and does the impossible. God still heals and does the impossible. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Now to Him who is, immeas- is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to His power, His healing power in this situation, that is at work within us. Don't lose sight of the God miracles in your life. Do not Put God in a box that says He cannot do it. He can't come through financially. He can't come through relationally. He can't come through my health. I wanna remind us all that God can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask, dream or imagine. He is at work. He is the impossible when things look impossible. He can do it. When I see pictures like that picture, it reminded me, thank you, Jesus, that you are healing. If you're here today and you still need a miracle in your body, let's believe that before the year ends, you are going to see a miracle in your body. You're going to see the sovereign hand of God touch your situation. You need a miracle in your marriage. We're going to believe that over your teenage kids, over your prodigal son or daughter. God, we are asking for miracles. Do not forget the impossible. When I look next door, don't forget the impossible. What He's already done and what He's still doing, you wait and see what He's going to do. Don't forget that He is at work if you've come in here a bit beaten up this year, if you walked in here with a bit of pain going on, He does the impossible. That's what God does. Turn to your neighbour and say, He's going to do it. Come on, turn to him and say, He is going to do it. Don't box God in. Some of you here, listen to me, you box God in. Stop doing it. Stop boxing Him in. He doesn't work with balance sheets. He doesn't work with relational things. He works however He wants to work in His time, at His time. He is the God who can do impossible things. So someone say that this morning. Thank you, God. You are on the move and full of faith, ready for what He's going to do. God still does miracles. I am so happy about that. If you get a chance, jump on Pastor Paul's Instagram and make a comment somewhere and say, thank you, Lord, for your healing power. They've given Him the all clear. Don't come back for a year. It's amazing. Honestly, it is a crazy story. All right, number three. Some of these are a bit quicker now. This is a, another little private photo. 
Now you notice my two friends there on the champagnes, I wasn't, you know, I don't drink alcohol. I was on the Diet Cokes. This is a photo of mine. Actually, happened to be wearing the same shirt, you're welcome. <laughs> Just for today. This photo was taken on my annual leave this year that I had in a place called Sri Lanka. We're in a place called Gaul at the very south there. And you might be like, Joel, why were you wearing a white shirt with these boys in the middle of Sri Lanka? And earlier this year, I got a phone call from a really good friend of mine who grew up. He was one of my, my mentors growing up. He was older than I was, and he, uh, he was uh, in my life from the time I was very young. Uh, and he's not in this photo, unfortunately. Uh, just the photo didn't have him in it. But it was his 50th birthday, and he reached out to me and said, Joel, he goes, I know you're a really busy person. I know you, it's unlikely, but would you be willing to come to Sri Lanka for my 50th birthday? He goes, it would mean the world to me to have my friends with me. And my first reaction was like, I'm too busy for that. I haven't got time for that. I haven't seen some of these guys for years. But something in me, the Holy Spirit said, no, prioritize it. Look, these are guys that invested in you when you were young. Go and spend time. So I said, Ellen, this is a bit strange. I'm going to go for a few days. Do you mind if I go? And, and then I can get to Korea on the way back and all that sort of stuff. I said, I can maximize my moment. I said, I don't know why I'm going there. I just feel like the Holy Spirit saying, go. And there was nothing in it for me other than like just my friends that I grew up with. And here on this photo on the left is a guy called Sam. And Sam was the best man at my wedding. And I hadn't seen him for 15 years. We grew up together in church, still with text and call, but really have grown apart. And he's a great guy that just, you know, he's busy, he runs his own big company in Sydney. And on the right there is my mate, Ben. Ben I've known since he was four years old. We went to church, he grew up together in church. And now, you know, me and Ben are 43, Sam's 47. And on this particular trip, we had a lot of downtime because you know, we all had our phones away. We had nothing to think about. We had no kids there. And it was actually really just amazing to sit and just reflect on years and years and years of history. Growing up together, some of the crazy stuff that we did in church together, some of the times we put aerosols in fire and blew up things at, at a church camp and we got in trouble back because you could do that back in the day. <laughs> Memories of crazy things that would happen. People along the way that had died that were our friends that had committed suicide. People who had had some health challenges. Friends that I hadn't spent much time with for a long time, but just knew as soon as we were back together, it was like nothing had ever changed. And I want to remind you today, value your friendships. Like I didn't realize that I went there thinking that maybe God wanted to use me to you know, help people get better relationships back on track with God. And I walked away and just felt like God was like, I just wanted you to go there just so you could feel fresh. I wanted to remind you that there are people in your life that you sowed a lot in many years ago that are reaping in your future. And I want to remind you today that you need to value your friendships. Proverbs 17 verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Uh, sorry, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For me personally, friendships are huge. We can get busy in life. And I look back and I'm thankful for the 40 plus years of friendships with those guys. Guys I've done a lot of yards with. I was able to minister to them in ways that they probably didn't expect. They kind of can't get their head around what I'm doing and I can't get my head around what I'm doing. So we both sit there and we all laugh together. And I'm like, who knew? They're like, why aren't you drinking beer? I said, well, I'm a different person these days. I'm on the Diet Coke because I only had that in Sri Lanka, no Pepsi Max. That was a bit, bit disappointing. So there's a business opportunity there for someone to export it to Sri Lanka. But I, I just definitely found myself in a season where it wasn't about the stuff, it was just about the friendship. It was a years of laughing of things that we had done. It was good for the soul. I know for many people that COVID was a very challenging time for friendships. Some of them, maybe some of your best friends, for whatever reason, you've gone separate ways. Maybe you had a different opinion on vaccinations. Maybe just over time you realized that because of a lack of proximity that you've grown apart. I know for me, I've lost a few friends in this last season and it, it can be painful. And it was a good reminder of me to go, I need to stop and value my friends. I need to be a good friend and also need to be there for my friends. I guess everyone has a different view on what a good friend is. Maybe there's different rules that you have that no one talks about. But can I remind you as believers that a good friend tells them to their face what they think, not what everyone else is telling them, not telling them behind their back. Good friends turn up to special occasions. They turn up to those birthdays. They turn up to their wedding. They turn up and they're all in in those occasions. Can I encourage you, a good friend looks them in the eyes and says some things that maybe no one else will ever tell them. Don't be that friend that just talks behind people's backs, but be honest with people. Show them your love. Show them that you care. Be a good friend. Because I'm telling you, what you sow in relationships, you will reap in your future. 
Let me say it again, what you sow, you reap. When I sat there in Sri Lanka, I sowed from 25, 30 years ago, deep roles of friendship, deep experiences, deep times of ministering to each other in prayer. Moments I was able to say, hey, can I remind you that back then when we were doing that missions trip together, your life looked very different to what it looked like now. What's happened? What's changed? What, can I help you? Can I pray for you? I mean, there was moments I'm telling you where I was ministering more in that 24 hour period than I was possibly in lots of sermons. Because what you sow, you reap. The wells that you dig, you will reap from. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. If you don't sow any friendship seeds, you're gonna be lonely. Maybe as you go into 2024, can I encourage you, what would it look like to be more intentional with friendships? Maybe you can't be friends with everyone, but you need to dig deeper wells and depth in friendships. But can I encourage you that friendship is a godly value. Be loyal to your friends. Encourage each other. Maybe there's been some friends that you need to reconnect with over the summer. Do it. Do whatever you can to extend the olive branch. I know that I'm committed to wanting to do that as much as I can as well. The first, fourth photo I want to show you, even during this one, should I, should I never do this again? I don't know. It's something different, right? Something different. Some of you look excited. It's Joel's private little snapshots, Kodak shots. This is a photo taken in a Chinese restaurant locally. And I just like the photo, so I just want to show it to you. I think it's funny. Mark Webber in a Chinese restaurant having two drinks. I don't know why I like that photo so much. I just do. There you go. Next photo. Can I just have some fun? I want to have some fun. I just think it's, that's a good photo. Here's the next photo. You see here my son Judah. I think he's got a booger on his nose too. No, that's ice cream. This is the byproduct of a well enjoyed gelato. This is Warren overindulging in a gelato. If there's anyone in the room who can eat as much gelato as they want, Warren is a good candidate for that. He, he would have worked that out in about five seconds, right? I've actually got a number of photos in my phone from this year of people eating gelato for whatever reason. Clearly, I like gelato. But I love this photo thinking to myself, Warren didn't just go half-hearted into that gelato. Like, look at the size of Warren's hand and then look at the gelato. It was massive. Good gelato. Judah. That was him wiping up the mess. That was the post of it. But you know what? Sometimes in life, if there's a lesson I can learn from looking at my photos, eat as much gelato as you can and enjoy the moments. Because usually, usually when you're having gelato, there's a reason for it. You're on holidays. Like it's been a hot day and you're like, man, I just want to go sit after the swim at the beach. And I know that like, you want me to tell you all to be healthy. And I know that you know, one of my goals at the start of my year was to be he you know, healthy across the year. But I've done it, I'm happy. But I had lots of gelato on the way. Why? Because it makes me happy. Now, if you're here and maybe you've got uh, any health allergies or all that stuff, maybe you, you can't have gelato like that, but maybe you can get the sorbet, okay? But when I look at the photos on my phone of that many people who had gelato, there's always a smile, they're always happy, they're enjoying the moment, and sometimes I think we just got to enjoy the moments. Psalm 118 verse 24 says this, this is the day the Lord has made, we will rejoice and eat gelato and be glad in it. I mean, <laughs> we've just got to enjoy the moments. It's like, dads, mums, like stop and go, let's grab some gelato. Well, it might be, let's get some fish and chips together. In a world that's so busy, just stop and enjoy the gelato. Enjoy those small moments. Enjoy it. When your kids are crazy running around everywhere, just stop and go, let's look at each other. Your husband and wife look at each other and go, this is crazy, but eat the gelato. At least we're going to make the most of the moment. I've got a leadership book that I use when I speak from, uh, you know, in staff meetings or what have you. And in the front of that book, there are three quotes from Billy Graham that I remind myself every time before I go and speak in a leadership environment. Now, I don't know if we have this quote on the screen somewhere available. I don't know if I sent it through, and if I didn't, I apologize. But let me read this to you. This is a Billy Graham quote that reminds me as a pastor. It says, pastors are not sent to make people happy, but to make them holy and healthy and to make the Lord happy. If you want to make people happy, go and start an ice cream shop. <laughs> let me read that again. It's pretty special. This is Billy Graham. This is his wisdom. Pastors are not sent to make people happy, but to make them holy and healthy and to make the Lord happy. If you want to make people happy, go and start an ice cream shop. And there is this fine tension I live my life with, that I want to enjoy the moments and the gelato, but also I have a responsibility that I'm not just here to make you happy. I'm here to say things as they need to be said. 
I'm here to lead as I need to lead, as the Lord encourages me to lead. There are moments where I'm gonna have to say some things that maybe you don't wanna hear, but that's the job of a shepherd. There are moments where maybe I can bring joy into your life or there's moments I can bring joy into my family's life. And I think there's this fine tension between I've actually learned that what actually brings greatest joy is making sure that the Lord is happy and from that place, everything else flows. If I'm living my life in a way that the Lord is pleased and I know that there's this deep sense of like, I'm doing things God's way. I'm living on purpose. I'm living on mission. I'm living with that sense of purpose. I'm telling you, there is this sense in your life that you can have your gelato and eat it. So you can have everything. I mean, it's just that sense of there's a joy that flows from that place. So can I encourage you, make the most of the moments. Embrace those moments, whether they're really small or really big. Whether you have to make a tough call and you know it's the right call, that it's not going to make everyone happy, but you just know it's the right thing that the Lord is asking. I've just learned that along the way, eat as much gelato as you can because it's good. Number six. Number, number, no. Is it number, no, because I put the sneaky Mike Webber one in. It's photo six. This is a candid shot of me and Ellen. We're down at Byron Bay for the day. And uh, I just hope I put it in there. It's nice. Number five, I want to remind you, invest in your marriage. Husbands, be good to your wives. And wives, be good to your husbands. It's quite a simple thought. I'm not going to try and overemphasize this. But here's the wisdom I want to show you. you know, we've been married for 23 years this year. And we got married young. We were 20 when we got married. And along the way, that means we've been married longer than we were not married. And we've had to grow a lot in that time, obviously going from like being really young, getting married, seasons of life where maybe others wouldn't normally be married. I was still at university. And along the way, we had to pass to you and keep growing up in that process and the tensions and the challenges and being parents and all that stuff. But here's something I would say that we have done well in our marriage that has really helped us in the tough times. Because if you just thought that that photo is our whole marriage all the time, you'd be sadly mistaken. The enemy will do everything he can to try and make it hard for us. But we have been committed in that process to investing in our marriage. So many years ago, we made the choice to be proactive in not just going to counselling because it was a problem, but being proactive to make sure that we always had someone to talk to. Someone to liaise between the challenges of, hey, I think this and you think that. And if you don't do the work of investing on the front end, I'm telling you when the challenges come, because they will come, then it's not just all hugs, cuddles, and sex. It's actually a lot of challenges along the way that you could actually find yourself going different directions. And so I want to encourage you that invest in your marriage. For those of you who are married here, invest in your marriage for a day that you're going to need in your future when you need someone else to speak into it. It could be an older person. Come on, if we're going to clap, let's clap. If it's, if it's a mentor, or if it's a... But don't get stuck in a cycle that says we have no one else speaking into our marriage because without it, I'm telling you, the enemy's got you isolated and it is a dangerous place to be. Be intentional with your marriage. If you don't know who to talk to, if you don't know where to start, can I encourage you to go to our Connection Hub? We've got a list of people there that you, of people you go and see. And you know what? Often these days you can't get in next week when you have the fight. You're actually going to have to like plan for three months from now and you'll think, oh, I don't need that today. Yes, you do. Sow the seeds three months from now because a year from now you might need them. So invest in your marriage. And the last one I want to show you as the, the team comes to join me this morning, has this, has this been okay? Should we, should we do, do it again maybe next year? Who knows? I don't know. It's different, right? It's different. If you don't like it, well, here you go. You follow me and we'll go to something else. Okay, number six. This is early in the year over in the Glue, Glow UK. I had a chance to land in London. And I thought, what do you do when you get to London? You go and see the king. And I, I, I was there and I got my phone out because all of a sudden, from the other side of Buckingham Palace came this royal carriage. And at first glance, it just looks like something you'd see on TV, right? But it's quite a, quite a picture when you're in person. It's quite, a, it's quite a snapshot when you're like, man, this is like, I see this on TV. And, and all of a sudden, not only was there one, there was two, there was three, there was four that started going past us. And I remember thinking to myself, is the king going to come out? Like, is the king in those carriages? And I was with uh, Joey and Monty and some other people we got chatting to. The, these Aussies came up to us and said, are you guys from Australia? We're like, yeah, we're from Australia. And they're like, oh, can you take a photo? We're from Logan. We're like, good to see you. Glad to have you here. And we got chatting, right? And in the background, these carriages had gone past. And then in the far corner of the, the property, there was, also, there was also some cars driving around. There was policemen. And everyone got busy chatting. And all of a sudden, in the distance, I saw this car coming with this massive royal insignia on the front. And as it got closer and closer, I could see that it was the king himself in the car. 
on a random day in the middle of London, it was raining, we had umbrellas. There was no reason for him to be outside of the palace because it said on the sign up, you know, the flag said he was there. And all of a sudden I was like, Monty, Joey, quick, the king is here. Monty, quick, quick, quick. They're like chatting to these people from Logan. I said, forget the people from Logan, the king is here. And I literally like run and I run over the top of like, there's this fountain area running because I want to come to the gate where he's going to be. And there's the king and Camilla in the car, clear as day, right, like literally right in front of us. And here's the thing, there was all the signs around that the king was about to come. There were so many pictures and moments, there were so many details that if you didn't notice them and see, there's one carriage, two carriages, three carriages, there's a police presence, they're blocking the road off. That tells me there's a good chance that the king is about to turn up. And I wanna remind you today, in my final thought, in my reflection, is that we need to live life with the lens of eternity. We are living in a time right now that there are enough signs around the place that the King is getting ready to come back. There is enough going on in the world we're living in. The rumours of wars, the wars, the nation against nation, the tensions, the challenges, the health crises. I'm telling you, there is enough signs of the time that could reflect that if you miss it and you blink that He could come back. And if we don't live with that lens of eternity, of the fact that the King could come at any moment, you're going to miss it. And Matthew chapter 13, verse 5 said, says this, Jesus replied, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and they will deceive you. And you will hear of wars and the threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains with what is to come. When these things begin to happen, watch out. Verse 32, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son Himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, Be on guard and stay alert. Can I remind you today, there is enough signs in the world right now that we must live with eternity in our mind. We don't need to live from a place of panic. We don't need to live from a place of like freaking out, but we should be living with eternity in our hearts and in our mind. We must be living with that lens saying that my life here is only a temporary thing. This life right now literally is that I am passing through because I am not a citizen of Australia. My citizenship is in heaven. And I was made for eternal purposes. And if I miss the fact that there is enough things going on around me, that there is enough to know that if the King's about to turn up, that I must be aware and live with that lens. And I wanna challenge you today, at the start of 2023, are you living with that lens? Are you living with the picture that He could come back at any moment? that I must live in that place and know that if He is Lord of my life, that I must have my life surrendered to His purposes, to His ways and His thoughts. And I wanna tell you this morning, as we have this year in review this thought, that if there's anything that's most important, that we need to live our life with that mindset, that if there's enough signs that the King is coming, don't miss it. Watch out, stay on guard. Live your life in 2024 on purpose and on mission. Can you stand to your feet this morning? My prayer that this this message today is different, but maybe it's made you want to stop and reflect this year. Can I encourage you to get your camera roll up this year? Go through the photos, go through the memories and say, what were the things that were going on in my life? What lessons can I learn? What can I reflect on? What can I keep doing well? But in the lens of all that, can I also remind us, let's never for one second, not for one moment, stop living with eternity in our hearts, with a lens of going that He could come back at any moment. And I don't want to be that, that person the Bible speaks about that was foolish enough to see the signs, but not actually be on guard. And with every eye closed this morning here, I want to give people an opportunity that maybe you're here. Maybe you've been thinking about Christmas time. You've been thinking about going to a church for Christmas. Maybe you used to go to church. Maybe you've been in different seasons. Maybe right now you've been coming to church all year, but you are far from God. You are backslidden. And I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you that if He is going to return in any moment and at any time, are you ready? 
Have you got that thought in your heart to go that God, that if you were to send your son to return, that I would be ready and I would be prepared? You might be here this morning thinking, what on earth do I have to do to make sure that I am ready? Well, the Bible says very simply in Romans 10 verse 9, that I need to believe in my heart and confess through my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe that He died and that He rose again. And if I do that, then I will be saved. It's a prayer that sounds so simple, but literally to surrender our life is never easy at all. It's a choice that's gonna cost you something, but it's a choice that I'm telling you will set you up knowing that you are living with eternity in your heart and in your mind and knowing that your life is not your own, but it is God's and that He wants to use you because He has a plan and a purpose. So with every eye closed here this morning, as we get close to ending off this year, I want you to know that we're gonna pray this prayer together. We're gonna ask Jesus to come into people's lives and set them free that as we reflect on this year, as we learn the lessons that there's nothing more important than knowing Jesus, that my life is yours and that I am surrendered to your plans and your purpose. So are we ready to pray this church? Here we go. Jesus, Jesus this, morning, this morning, I invite you, I invite you into my life. Into my life. Would, you me would you forgive me of all of my sin? Of all my sin. And would you exchange my past for your amazing future? For your amazing future. I believe, I believe that you died, you died and that you rose again. And you rose again. And from this day forward, from this day forward, I am gonna follow you. Gonna follow you. Follow you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, church, let's give them a shout of praise in this place. So if you just made that decision, we would love to partner together with you as a church. If you just head to our website, we've got some great resource that can help equip you further on your journey. Amazing. Hey, let me pray for your week before we go. God, I just thank you for every person who is watching online. Bless them, go before them in whatever they do, Lord. We just pray your favour would be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you later.